Good morning. Happy Easter. My name is Zach Galifianakis, and this is Between Two Ferns. I got that joke approved from my wife yesterday, and so begrudgingly, she didn't really want me to tell it, but she gave in. And if you don't know what that show is, that's fine too. Um, anyway, welcome. It is Easter Sunday, and we are thrilled that you're here with us. I do have one housekeeping note. You do not have to go to the bathroom in that bathroom during the service. If you want to, that's fine. But if like you got to go and you don't want to be there, there's a restroom out this door to my left and then back down that hallway. You'll see the signage if you head that way. Just if that's not your jam, which it might not be, then you can go to that restroom out there. So on Palm Sunday, which was last week in real time when Jesus was coming in on a donkey, they shouted out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what was trending on Twitter that Sunday. But there was this moment where the Pharisees and the scribes looked at Jesus, the religious leaders of the day, and said, hey, that seems sacrilegious. They didn't believe he was God. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. So they said, make them be quiet and stop saying it. And Jesus looks at them and he says, hey, guess what? If I told them to be quiet, to not say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the rocks would cry out. They would sing the praises of Jesus. Well, what happens? By Friday, Hosanna isn't trending on Twitter anymore. Crucify him is. The Hosanna has faded out. It's silent. There's no more words about Jesus being the son of, of David and coming in the name of the Lord. The crowds have been silenced. And what does God do on Sunday morning? He takes a rock and he rolls it away from the mouth of another rock cave. And that rock cries out, right? Jesus is alive. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I think that's beautiful. And today we celebrate that together as the people of God. The tradition is to say he is risen and then the uh, congregants, that's you today, respond he is risen indeed. He is risen. risen That's beautiful. Father, today, meet with us here. It's Easter Sunday and maybe we came by invitation, maybe we came because it's, it's just tradition, but what we really need is an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And so we pray today that that will be the reality for us today, that you will meet us in the lowest places or wherever we find ourselves, and you will bring renewal, that you will raise dead hearts to life just like you raised your son Jesus to life. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long to be comforted, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and to anyone else who will come. We open wide our arms and we open wide our doors and we welcome you in the name of the resurrected Jesus. He is risen. He is is risen risen indeed. Will you stand with us? We're going to sing together this morning. That's how we start our services together, proclaiming truth to one another of the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Before we do, I want to read from Matthew 28. This is good news here. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And before there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled. And became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. But he is not here for he has risen. As he said, 
Come see the place where he lay. Christ is risen. Let's lift our voices together and sing this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. And Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. And Christ is risen from the grave. The prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Come on, church. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, and all throughout eternity, our song will be the same, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, and I see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. And hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise is the name forever. Hallelujah. From the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, and all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, and all eternity our song will be the same hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave sing the third verse again and on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace. And I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Continue singing together. (laughs) 
The cross is my beginning The line drawn in the sand The end of all my striving Now I am born again There Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won, he is risen, grace is here, love has triumphed over death forever. The cross needs no addition. His mercy is complete. His love is not in question. The Son of God has spoken over me. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Grace is here, love has triumphed over death forever. Resurrection power over every circumstance. His word stands final and forever. It will not be shaken. He alone has won it all. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. Grace is here, love has triumphed over death forever. It is done, it is finished, mercy won, I'm forgiven, sing his name. chapter 8 we're told what then shall we say of these things if God is for us who can be against us for he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also with him graciously give us all things who shall bring any charge against God's elect it is God who justifies who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God and interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. 
In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, heights, depths, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we sing this together. Strongholds bowing to the Savior, resurrection power over every circumstance. His word stands final and forever. It will not be shaken. He alone has won it all. Strongholds bowing to the Savior. Resurrection power over every circumstance. His word stands final and forever. It will not be shaken. He alone has won it all. Amen. And on the hill your blood was spilled, your brow, your hands, your feet. With nails and thorns, the veil was torn to make a way for me. Lord, you made a way for me. Jesus, Savior, my God, my King, my Lord. And Jesus, Savior, the victory. and bound they laid you down a perfect sacrifice but in three days the stone was rolled away forever you're alive forever you're alive Jesus, Savior, my God, my King, my Lord. And Jesus, the Savior, the victory. Jesus is risen, life ever after. Sing it again. Now death has been beaten, the grave has been conquered, and Jesus is risen. Life ever after 
and death has been beaten, the grave has been conquered, and Jesus is risen, life ever after, and Jesus Christ has not been raised, 1 Corinthians says, for your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That is our hope today. That is our peace. Sing one more song together. This is one of our favorites here. He is our hope. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, and death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning, 
that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Sing it again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yes, Jesus, yours is the victory. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. And death has lost its grip on me. And you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And Jesus Christ, my living hope. Heavenly Father, thank you today. For Jesus, Thank you for sending him to die in our place. On the cross, he took the full wrath of, of your condemnation against sin, God. And we are just a, a benefit of what uh, Jesus has done for us. We look to him today because of his life, his death. He is alive today. And that's why we're gathered here together to celebrate that. Because we've been grafted into your family. We've been brought near to the Father because of the Son. Thank you today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids. uh, You're dismissed. If you're new with us, the kids always hang out through the singing. uh, Because they're the best singers that we have. Um. Other than the the band, obviously. I, other than the band, but uh, yeah. So we let them stick around. If you're if you need to follow your kids back to find out where they're going to be, that's absolutely fantastic. While I'm waiting on some of the parents to come back, they won't get this apologetics lesson. I'll give you just two reasons. To embrace the resurrection today as, as reality. To uh, just root it in the actual story itself. Here they are. The first is this. The story of the resurrection originates in the place where it happens. Now, what I mean by that is this. This is just, this is just factoids for you. It originates in the place where it happens. Think about that for a second, right? If I said to you, right... I can dunk a basketball, you could ask immediately for the receipts, show me, and you would find out I was lying very quickly. Then if I told you, yeah, but 20 years ago, when I was 17, I could dunk a basketball. Now, if I'd moved to Australia and I was living there just by myself, I could say that and nobody would know whether it was true or false. But if I said that here, where I've grown up and lived my whole life, there'd be a, a dozen upon dozens of ways you could, could check for the receipts, and there would be none. Obviously, I could never dunk a basketball. So when the 
story of the resurrection originates in the place where it happens, there's a lot of ways that you can disprove that. All they got to do is pull out the body. Hey, you mean this Jesus came back to life? This dead body right here? And the powers that be, had they wanted to squelch this rumor. The religious rulers did. The political leaders did. And yet it proceeds and persists. The second one is kind of like it. The people who proclaim the resurrection have nothing to gain from it. Like this isn't a bunch of rich white men in power making up a story, right, about a raised Jesus so that they now can have better lives and they can have influence. No, the first witnesses are women. They couldn't even testify in court in that day, but that's how God chooses to write the story. We got Africans and uh, from West Africa that are a part of the beginning, right? These aren't people in power. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Not only do they have nothing to gain for proclaiming this story, they have everything to lose. And one by one, they lose their lives for proclaiming the resurrection is true. Those are two reasons, right? Rooted in the actual story itself. The story of the resurrection originated where it was, could have easily been disproved, wasn't. And the people who proclaimed the resurrection is true had everything to lose and nothing to gain. So rest secure, right? If you needed that today, if you need a reassurance of the reality of what we're celebrating today, hopefully that can that can help. One thing, if you're new with us and uh, you want more information, we also have a gift for you too. You can fill out one of these connect cards. They're in the lobby and there's a, a room. If you walk out that door right there, you would walk straight into it. It says meeting room on the side and we have a gift for you today. Um, it's got a gift card in it for some coffee and some other information. So if you fill out one of these connect cards and take it to that uh, door, the doorway of the room that says meeting room on it, you can collect that that free gift. That's our our uh, hospitality uh, to you. So, without further ado, let's preach an Easter sermon. My daughter's made in Uganda. She's not made in the USA. She's made in Uganda. You might have seen her today wearing a beautiful, uh, traditional Ugandan dress called a Gomesi. She came into our family in 2016. Uh, In fact, our Easter of 2016 was spent in Uganda. It was bittersweet. We weren't with our boys, but we were with our daughter. We weren't with our home church, but we were with new folks who we were learning were going to be some of our deepest friends and relationships that we would have. But another memory I have, so she comes home in May. Uh, We get here. That fall, Mama passed away. my wife's grandma. And it was expected, right? It was eventually going to happen, it, but it's still devastating. You know that. Even when you lose someone at the time where it's maybe expected to lose them, it's still devastating, but a memory I'll never forget. So on the day of the funeral, there in Milton, Pawpaw's getting ready to walk up to the coffin One last look at his wife's dead body. She wasn't there, but her body was. They're going to close the cactus. And as he, right, I I mean, I I can't imagine making that walk. It's a long walk. And as he walks, this phoenix from Uganda, now an Appalachian queen, that's what we tell her. (laughs) She takes hold of his hand and walks up there with him. In that low place, she was present with him. Today, I want you to know that the resurrected Jesus is present with you in your lowest place. And not only that, but the resurrected Jesus meets us in our lowest places with sweet renewal that only he can be can bring. Not only is he with us in our lowest place, he brings renewal in our lowest place. There's a mission statement on the wall to my left, your right, says we exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And so we'd been preaching through the book of Ephesians. We took 
two weeks off for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And we talked about last week how redemption is rooted in the resurrection. And this week, we're going to talk about how renewal is rooted in the resurrection. Resurrection renewal is, is ours through the risen Jesus. So, Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of the resurrected Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to meet four people in their lowest place. Watch this play out. The first is Mary. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but Mary Magdalene. Man, she had a story. Jesus had met her, right? And he had met her when she had all her demons, literally. He'd cast them out. He'd met her when she was at the lowest of the low. She was on, she was among the untouchables. You wouldn't touch her. You wouldn't be near her. You wouldn't come close to her. And Jesus rescued her in that place. Jesus met her there, but now he's gone. We find her on Easter Sunday morning, but she doesn't know. She didn't have an invitation, right? No, to show up at 10 a.m. for food and 10.30 for worship. She's there. Mary stood. This is John chapter 20, verse 11, stood weeping outside the tomb. Feel her pain, please. As she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So much grief in her heart that she can't even see that these are heavenly beings in front of her. She can't see because of her grief. Her eyes are blurred by the tears. The man who had rescued her, who had brought her from death to life spiritually, is gone. Her best friend is gone, and she's in grief. Maybe you've lost someone even this year. Maybe it was lost through death. Maybe it was uh, a relationship that broke, or maybe you lost something that was dear to you. Whatever it is, if you know grief, then you know where Mary was at with her face in her hands, tears running down her face. If you've cried like that, where the tears run out, if you've been there, If you have, you know where Mary was at, in the grief. The next person we meet is Thomas. He's just a few verses over in in chapters 24 and 25. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Jesus raises from the dead, comes to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas gets a bad rap. We all like to throw stones at Thomas, right? But how many of you have stones like Thomas? Not mean to say it that way. If you go back a few chapters to John chapter 11, you meet Thomas right before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And everybody remembers that part of the story. But what a lot of people don't remember about that story is that they had fled from Judea, the disciples and Jesus, because they were trying to kill Jesus. So when Jesus says, let's go back to Judea, to Bethany, because Lazarus is sleeping, I'm going to wake him up, he's dead, right? They say, are you sure? They tried to kill us last time. And, and look, what, look what Thomas says in, in uh, John chapter 11, verse 16. He simply says, so, uh, so Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Jesus was everything to Thomas. Everything. He'd given up all of his life to follow this man, and he had found something in this man that he was willing to die for. But instead of him being the one that that died, it was Jesus who died. And he's not about to open himself back up to that kind of pain. So he found himself in a place of deep, deep doubt. The last person we meet is, is Cleopas, Luke chapter 
24. I think he's with his wife as he walks down this, this road uh, to Emmaus. That very day, two of them, two of Jesus' followers, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were walking with each other, talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were walking and discussing together, Jesus himself, resurrected Jesus himself, drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. What we'll find out in a second is that they were in a place of, in fact, let's just read it. Verse 21 says, this is what they said to Jesus. Because they're heartbroken. And he's asking them, what's going on? Why are you heartbroken? What's, and they said, we had hoped that he, Jesus, was the one to redeem Israel. They wanted political restoration, that the Jews could, could have a, a Messiah that would come and reign and set God's kingdom up here on earth. That was their dream. That was their desire. That he would redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when he, he, they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive, but yet they're going back to Emmaus, seven miles. They didn't believe. If they believed Jesus was alive, if you believe that a dead man who you've given your life to for the last three years has come back to life, you're sticking around. You want to see him. They're not. They're hoofing it seven miles back to Emmaus. Their dreams have been shattered. So we have Mary and her grief. We have Thomas in his doubt. We have Cleopas in, her, in, his, in his wife's most likely shattered dreams and despair. And then there's Peter, this guy. Chapter 22 of Luke 59 through 62. I went backwards, I'm sorry, to the slide, guys. And after an interval of about an hour, still another, right? Peter is around the fire. The trial of Jesus is happening within, you know the story. He can see it happening. And three, two times already, somebody said, you were with the Galilean. He says, no, I wasn't. It wasn't me. He's denied him twice in verse 59. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. You imagine, you said you didn't know the man three times. You followed him for three years. At the Last Supper, you told him you would never deny him. And you just did three times. And the rooster crows and your eyes lock. Can you imagine the shame that he felt in that? That's where Peter found himself. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. They had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Here's my point. We meet these people at their lowest in their grief, in their doubt, in their shame, in their despair. Here's the beauty of the resurrected Jesus. He's going to step into that place with them. Mary first. That is one of my favorite, favorite parts. Back to chapter 20, verses 14 through 16. Having said this, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where to find him. She's in her grief. You know, mascara still stains her cheeks, right? She's still heaving from the crying. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will t uh, take him away. By the way, her greatest hope is to find Jesus' dead body. See that in the story. That's her greatest hope. That's what she desires. Jesus says, now i got something better for you. Right? How about my living body? Jesus said to her, Mary. Hear me, only one person said her name like that. Only one person could say her name like that and all of her demons be cast out. 
Only one person had ever said her name like that. And he says, Mary. And she turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus comes to her in her grief. If you're in grief today, Jesus can come to you too. The resurrected Jesus comes to his children in the grief. Thomas, same chapter, verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. This time Thomas is with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and, and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas. And if I were Jesus, I'd have been like, hey, check it out, man. Put, put your finger there. Come on. Look at me. You didn't think I could come back to life, did you? Right? No. He extends to him. He says, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. You know what you don't read there? You don't read that Thomas touched his hands. You don't read that Thomas put his hands in his side. He believed, my Lord, my God, the resurrected Jesus came to him in his doubt. If you find yourself in a place of doubt today, he comes to you as well. Peter, John chapter 21, verses 17 through 19. Remember this? Peter goes out fishing. He's actually seen the resurrected Jesus already, but that stain of betrayal that he feels, that shame, that guilt, that pain, he hasn't got past it. He's going back to the to work. And they fish all night. And somebody shows up on the shoreline and says, hey, cast the net on the other side because they ain't caught nothing all night. So they cast it on the other side. And as soon as they do, that net fills up with more fish than they can even haul into the boat. They like have to ride the boat back to the shore. And John, the disciple, says, hey, that's Jesus. And Peter, finally, throws himself into the water. And when he gets there, Jesus got a little fish fry going, right? They got a little Captain D's, right? A little dinner. And he sits there and he has this moment with Peter where he says, hey, do you love me? Peter says, you know that I love you. And then Jesus asked him again, do you love me? Remember three, the threes, three betrayals, three questions. Do you love me? Peter says, you know that I love you. And in verse 59, we, we pick up the last part of the story. I'm sorry, 26. I'm lost, guys. I'm so into this, I can't even find it. Whose Bible is this? John chapter 21, verses 17 and 19. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything you, uh, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, when you were old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said. Show the way, the kind of death that Peter would have. And after saying this, he said, follow me. Jesus steps into his shame. He says, follow me. If you're in shame today, the resurrected Jesus comes to you in your shame. And then lastly, in despair, Luke chapter 24, verses 27 through 31. And beginning with Moses, they're still on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and his wife. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He says, the Old Testament's all about me. Can't you see it? And he preaches a sermon to them. And they drew near to the village, which they were going. He acted as if they were going, as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. For it is toward evening and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Into their despair, Jesus comes and he'll come to you in your despair, too. But the last point is this. Jesus doesn't just come to you in your lowest place. He will bring renewal with him when he meets you in your lowest place. Jesus will meet you where you are, but in his grace, he will not leave you 
where you are. Watch Mary, verses 14 through 16, or just verse 18 of chapter 20. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Remember her posture? Head down, tears on her face, face buried in her hands. Now she's running to find the disciples. Now her head is lifted up. Jesus is going to leave her again, by the way, physically. Not too long from now, he will ascend back to heaven, physical absence of Jesus, but because he is spiritually with her and alive. You know where she ends up most likely, according to church history? The church at Ephesus. We're preaching through the book of Ephesians currently. We took a break for this season, but but she is likely there in that church, that seedbed of a church as it grows. She never stops believing. He renews her spirit. Thomas? you got to go to church history to see what happens to him. He likely ends up in India, right? To the ends of the earth, takes the Great Commission seriously. He goes, right, and preaches Jesus, risen from the dead, until they kill him with the spear. To the end, renewed in his faith. Mary goes from grief to resilient joy. Thomas goes from doubt to death-defying faith. Peter, look at him in the Acts, man. He preaches this massive sermon. On the day of of Pentecost, Acts uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 32, he says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Skip to verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, and those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 people. The seedbed of the church, right, came from a sermon of the one who betrayed Jesus. He took his betrayal, right, his shame, he met him in his shame, and he turned it to humble boldness. Peter, according to church tradition, ends up being crucified. And at the last moment, he has one dying request. He says, I can't die right side up. I can't die like my Lord. Turn me upside down. And they crucify him upside down because he's got that humility. He says, I can't die like Jesus. By the way, right? It doesn't sound like renewal, right? Dying. They found something worth living for and worth dying for. That's renewal. Death wasn't the end for them, and they knew that. Death can be renewal if what you're living for is something worth dying for. And they had found that. And then we meet Cleopas and his wife, verse 20, or chapter 24, verses 34 and 35. They'd walk seven miles, heads down, sad. What do they do next? Actually, I'll start verse. 30, uh, 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us uh, while he talked with us on the road? And he opened to us the scriptures and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem seven miles and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered saying, the Lord has risen indeed. Did you know they started that tradition? That's where it started with these guys. Seven miles back, He is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. Jesus met them in their despair and turned their despair into enduring confidence. We're still proclaiming that message to this day. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And into our grief, into our doubt, into our shame, into our despair, that Message still echoes. He is risen indeed. And he'll meet us in those places. And get this, his resurrection is your resurrection. My daughter Phoenix walked up there to the side of that coffin. She held the hand of Papa. He said his goodbyes and they they put it down. Because there was one thing... My daughter couldn't do. 
She couldn't do anything about that dead body. But Jesus can. And Jesus will raise Mama back to life because she was in Christ. Not only is there renewal for today, there is renewal forever in Jesus. First Corinthians chapter four. This is why our hope of renewal is rooted in the resurrection. Verse 14 knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus, God himself, will raise us along with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. You will stand with Jesus in the presence of God, and death cannot change that. And when you're there, Papa's gone now too. I can see my daughter holding both of their hands at the same time. And this is where our hope is rooted, our hope of renewal. Paul goes on to say, because of this reality, verse 16, we do not lose heart. In our grief, we do not lose heart. In our doubt, we do not lose heart. In our shame, we do not lose heart. In our despair, we do not lose heart. Heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Tell me about it. I can't play basketball anymore without getting injured. The outer self is wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day by day by day. And it's the resurrection power of Jesus that does that for this light momentary affliction. Feels heavy now. Paul's not being flippant. Paul knows what it is to suffer. He's not making light of your grief. He's not making light of your shame. He's not making light of your doubt. He's not making light of your despair. I promise you that. He gets it. He knows it. But he says this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Your despair, he's working it out. Your grief, he's working it out. Your doubt, he's working it out. And what he's accomplishing is beyond anything you could ever imagine. Renewal day by day by day. Renewal forever and ever and ever because of the resurrected Jesus. And if you're not a Christian, that renewal can be yours today. Simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31. You come to Jesus And say, I can't handle this grief. I can't handle this despair. I can't handle this doubt. I can't handle the shame. But because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, I believe that it can be handled by you. Believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. and He's going to save you. No one who comes to him believing will be cast out. No matter how much shame or despair or doubt or grief you carry. Trust in the day. If you have questions about what that looks like, let me know. I would love to talk with you about that. And children of God, we experienced that. I have prayed all week that you would experience that today if you're in those places. Or other places too. They might not, your scenario might be different than the ones we read. The resurrected Jesus will meet you there today, tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. And then lastly, might we individually and as a church, be places of resurrection renewal. Because the resurrected Jesus is at work in us. Might we be the kinds of people that when those around us find themselves in despair and doubt and grief and shame, they can come here as a safe place. They can come to you as a safe place. Because the resurrected Jesus is at work in you. You can be with them present in their lowest places, pointing them to the renewal that is in Jesus. The resurrected Jesus meets us in our lowest places with sweet renewal that only he can bring. Father, I know where nobody's at today. I know where some are at. I don't know where everybody's at. I don't know what the fears and doubts and grief 
despair that's going on in everyone's heart. And I can't speak to any of them, but you can. For you meet them in this place that Jesus, risen indeed, you will meet them in this place with your presence and you will renew their spirit. Father, you raised Jesus from the dead so that we might cling to hope even in the lowest places. Might that hope be so very obvious to your children today. Meet us where we are. Whatever lies ahead and whatever lies behind us, the resurrection is bigger. Might we see that today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now we're going to dismiss you guys. That was fast. Maybe you didn't feel like it was. I want to say thank you to so many people. I won't even, if I start listing names, leave them out. But like breakfast this morning, we had a thing on Friday night, uh, a celebration out at the park with a big Easter egg hunt. A lot of you sitting in this room, you, you showed up and you put the work in and you gave generously. So I just showed up on Friday night. I didn't do anything. I showed up today and pretended like I knew how to preach. The body of Christ works. It does. And I'm so thankful for everyone who put time in to see this weekend come together. And if you're interested in what's happening at Mercy Village Church, if you don't have a church home, we'd love to welcome you into this ragged family. And uh, and if you have any questions about how you can get connected, just let us know. Like I said, fill out one of those connect cards uh, that are in the lobby out there, and we'll follow up. We'd love to love to meet you. This is from Isaiah 43. It's our hope, the resurrection. And on this high note, God says, do not be afraid for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters in great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. And with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, he is at work in us. You're dismissed. He is risen.